The knee joint plays an essential role in movement related to carrying the body weight in the horizontal direction, such as running and walking, and in the vertical direction, such as jumping or squatting. It's one of the most complex joints in the body. It combines a large range of motion with great stability. It's most stable in its closed pack position of full extension. The knee joint is comprised of the articulation between the bicondylodistal femur and the plateaus of the tibia and their menisci, referred to as the tibiofemoral joint, and the articulation of the patella with the anterior inferior surface of the femur, referred to as the patellofemoral joint. The tibiofemoral joint is a hinge type of synovial joint. Hinge joints are typically capable of only one degree of freedom, which is rotation about the x-axis in the sagittal plane, resulting in flexion and extension movement. However, the tibiofemoral joint is also capable of some medial and lateral rotation, particularly evident in a flexed position, which leads some authorities to classify it as a modified hinge joint. A thin layer of hyaline cartilage covers the articulating surfaces of the tibia and femur. This creates a smooth, low friction articulating surface and provides some shock absorption. The intervening lateral and medial menisci provide additional shock absorption, assist with lubrication and help to distribute force by increasing joint surface congruence. The C-shaped medial meniscus is less mobile than the more circular-shaped lateral meniscus, making it more susceptible to shearing and rotational forces, resulting in a greater incidence of injury. There are four primary ligaments that help to stabilise the knee, the anterior cruciate, the posterior cruciate, the medial collateral and the lateral collateral. The anterior cruciate ligament attaches to the anterior aspect of the tibial plateau in the intercondylar region. In this image, the femur has been bisected to reveal the inner surface of the lateral condyle. The anterior cruciate ligament is typically divided biomechanically into two parts, an anteromedial band and a larger posterolateral band. The posterolateral band is under greatest tension in a position of knee extension, while the anteromedial is under greatest tension in knee flexion. This means that throughout the range of knee movement, the ligament maintains some degree of tension and therefore provides stability and helps to guide motion. The anterior cruciate ligament helps to prevent anterior displacement of the tibia relative to the femur and is usually tested in that fashion by tests such as the anterior drawer and Lockman's. The posterior cruciate ligament attaches to the posterior aspect of the tibia in the intercondylar region and is directed upwards, forwards and medially to attach to the medial condyle. It passes the anterior cruciate on its medial aspect creating a cross leading to the name cruciate. It's shorter and stronger than the anterior cruciate. The posterior cruciate ligament also provides stability to the knee throughout its range of motion and helps to prevent posterior displacement of the tibia relative to the femur and is usually tested in that fashion by tests such as the posterior drawer and Godfrey's. The cruciate ligaments also assist with frontal plane stability of the knee with the posterior cruciate helping to prevent lateral displacement of the tibia and the anterior cruciate helping to prevent medial displacement. The medial collateral ligament is also known as the tibial collateral ligament. It's a strong, flat band, 8 to 9 centimetres in length. It's attached to the medial epicondyle of the femur and passes inferiorly and slightly forward to attach from the edge of the medial tibial plateau to the superior medial surface of the tibial shaft. It blends anteriorly with the medial patella retinaculum while it's strengthened posteriorly by the tendon of the semimembranosus. The medial collateral ligament is divided anatomically into two parts. A deep, shorter part blends with the joint capsule to cross the joint space, 
while the more superficial part extends the full length of the ligament. Its innermost fibres are attached to the medial meniscus. The medial collateral ligament is aligned to resist gapping on the medial side of the knee with valgus loading and is tested accordingly with the valgus stress test. It also becomes tight in full extension of the knee, contributing to the stability of the knee in that position. In addition, it assists the anterior cruciate ligament in limiting anterior displacement of the tibia relative to the femur. The lateral collateral ligament is also called the fibula collateral ligament. It's shorter than the medial collateral ligament at about 5 cm and is rounded and cord-like. It's attached to the lateral epicondyle of the femur and passes inferiorly and slightly backwards to attach to the head of the fibula where it blends with the tendon of the biceps femoris. Unlike the medial collateral ligament, it's not attached to the joint capsule of the lateral meniscus. The tendon of the popliteus muscle and the lateral inferior genicular artery, vein and nerve pass between the ligament and the capsule. The lateral collateral ligament is aligned to resist gapping on the lateral side of the knee with varus loading and is tested accordingly with the varus stress test. It also becomes tight in full extension of the knee, contributing to the stability of the knee in that position. There are a number of other ligaments providing support to the knee, including the posterior meniscofemoral ligament, which is called the ligament of Risberg. This is a small fibrous band that attaches to the posterior area of the lateral meniscus and crosses superiorly and medially behind the posterior cruciate ligament to attach to the medial condyle of the femur. Other tissues contribute to knee stability. For example, resistance to excessive external rotation and posterior translation of the tibia is provided by the posterior cruciate ligament and the postolateral corner structures. These include lateral collateral ligament, popliteus tendon, biceps femoris tendon, popliteofibular ligament, postolateral joint capsule, arcuate ligament, and posterior horn of lateral meniscus. Bursi are typically found in predictable locations around the knee joint between structures where there's friction or movement. They are prone to inflammation when subjected to impact trauma or repeated microtrauma, resulting in localised swelling and pain. They include the suprapatellar bursa, located between the quadriceps tendon and the femur, the prepatellar bursa, located between the anterior surface of the patella and the overlying skin, the superficial infrapatellar bursa, located between the tibial tubercle and the overlying skin. The deep infrapatellar bursa, located between the distal aspect of the patella tendon and the tibia. The semimembranosus bursa, located between the tendon of the semimembranosus and the medial collateral ligament. And the pezanserine bursa, located at the upper medial tibia. It separates the pezanserine tendons, consisting of the distal sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosus tendons, from the distal tibial insertion of the medial collateral ligament. To accommodate the full range of flexion and extension, the tibiofemoral joint must undergo rolling, gliding, and rotation. If not, the larger femoral condyle circumference would lead to a dislocation relative to the shorter tibial plateau. During flexion, the femur rolls posteriorly and glides anteriorly upon the tibia. During extension, the femur rolls anteriorly and glides posteriorly upon the tibia. In the final 30 degrees of extension, and particularly the last 5 degrees, the tibia undergoes external rotation relative to the femur. This rotation is referred to as the screw home mechanism, and it's the result of the differences in the circumference of the medial and lateral femoral condyles, the shape and size of the menisci, and the tension that develops in the various passive restraints. 
The screw home mechanism is considered to be a key element in producing knee stability in the fully extended position. Any aberration in this mechanism indicates disruption of the passive ligamentous or cartilaginous components and can be assessed by Helfert's test. This concludes the video presentation for this section. You can replay the video or continue on to the next part in this study unit.